Hello and welcome to Woodside Green Christian Centre. We're here at the church building once again and uh, this part of the service will be recorded and used in the video that is going out on YouTube. Six o'clock on Sunday evenings is the time for the video on YouTube and we are meeting here at 10 o'clock in the morning. We've had a time of worship and a time of breaking bread and now we're going to look in a moment to God's word. But let me just... uh, Let me just say a few words from Numbers and chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. We're now going to have our first hymn. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And it has that chorus, a repetitive chorus, but lovely words. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. Let's sing. Sing 
Let's come to God in prayer now, shall we? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we bring our worship and praise to you for your infinite greatness, your justice and holiness, and your grace and mercy. You have looked on us with love and sent the Son of God to be the sacrificial lamb on the cross. While we were sinners, our Lord died for us. When we were without hope, Jesus gave his life to bring us hope. When we were dead in our sins, you made us alive with Christ. Be with us through all the trials of life, we pray, and lead us in the way of holiness. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing again a lovely old hymn with quite a history to it. This hymn has encouraged and inspired Christians for many years, even more so when we know the history of the tragedies that led to why it was written. Horatio Spafford was an American lawyer and Presbyterian church elder who in 1871 suffered the death of his four-year-old son and was financially ruined by the loss of property in the great Chicago fire in which he had invested significantly. Two years later, he planned to travel to Europe with his family on the SS Wilde Havre. In a late change of plan, he sent the family ahead while he was delayed on business. While crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the ship sank rapidly after a collision with a sea vessel, the Loch Ern, and all four of Spafford's daughters died. His wife, Anna, survived and sent him the now famous telegram, Saved Alone. Shortly afterwards, as Spafford travelled to meet his grieving wife, he was inspired to write these words as his ship passed near where his daughters had died. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows, like sea billows, roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Let's sing that lovely hymn.
Let me just bring to you the program. 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings, we meet here at Woodside Green Christian Centre for our service of uh, bread and wine, worship, and then a Bible talk. 6 o'clock Sunday evening, the Sunday service is available on YouTube. And at the same time, there is a sister's prayer meeting on Zoom, and details will be sent out. On Wednesday, 8 p.m., we have a Bible study and prayer time, again on Zoom, and details and links will be sent out to those who participate. On Thursday, a prayer update email will be sent out for our prayer needs, and also a reminder with that, please send in your specific prayer requests so they can be added to that email when it goes out. On Friday evening... At 8 o'clock is a brother's prayer meeting uh, on Zoom. Details will be sent out for that. Uh, Just a couple of other things. We uh, do give our congratulations to Daniel and Lois who were married last weekend on Saturday in Northern Ireland. So our thoughts and prayers are with them as they have now started married life together. And we thank God that they were able to actually get married in these difficult times. So we praise God for that. They had a great time, so I'm told. A wonderful occasion, and we do pray for them going forward. Can we also continue to pray for Moira? We haven't seen her since the lockdown. She hasn't been able to come out. But it is her birthday on August the 9th. We're coming up to her birthday. So I have sent out details with the newsletter for those who are on the email list. And uh, please do send a card to her with your greetings for her birthday so that we can remind her that we're still thinking of her and praying for her. So that's for Moira. Please do send a card to her for the 9th of August. Each week we refer to a psalm, and we've got up to Psalm 51 this week, quite a famous psalm. It's a psalm of repentance by David when he realised the sin that he had committed. It's fully repentant and really puts David in a true perspective, having been a someone who sinned greatly against the Lord, but still he understood, recognised what he had done, and he came in full repentance and with a contrite heart before God. So it's something that we can read through and we can share in and appreciate too his feelings and echo them ourselves. Psalm 51, please do read it in your own time. We're now going to sing again. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every
because we stood neath the deck we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Now we're going to come to God's Word. And the series that we're just beginning now is based on James's letter, entitled Living the Life as a Christian. Living the Life as a Christian. James was thought to be a, a brother, an actual brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in his letter, he doesn't refer to that. He doesn't claim to be someone special. He is merely a servant, as he describes himself, rather than an actual brother of the Lord Jesus. But he brings probably some of the most practical teaching we have in the New Testament. And we're going to be looking at this over the next few weeks. So we begin with James' letter, chapter 1, and reading verses 1 to 8. James, chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. This letter deals with the struggles we have in the Christian life. There is an assumption on James's part that he is writing to those who have a genuine faith in Christ. Not a Christian influence or heritage, not a casual or occasional faith or an intellectual assent. He is referring to a life-changing regeneration of our soul, where every aspect of our temporal lives and our spiritual lives are in God's hands and at his command and disposal. The true believer has seen the need for forgiveness for their sin by God and has accepted that it is only possible through faith in Jesus Christ, in particular his death on the cross that met the judgment price for our sin. This is the only way to find peace with God and escape his judgment. It is a free gift of life from God born of his love and compassion, who has looked at the selfishness and greed of our hearts and, rather than condemn us all, has instead provided the means whereby he, a just and holy God, can actually forgive us. He does not stop at simply saving us from the consequences of our sin and rebellion, but he has adopted us into his family and granted us a heavenly inheritance that is beyond anything this world can offer. The true Christian, upon repenting of their sin and believing in the saving power of the death of Jesus, 
desires to follow and serve the risen Lord Jesus in order to bring glory and honour to his name. It is the struggle to be faithful and the difficulty we still have with our preponderance to sin that James is addressing in this letter. We go through times of testing and even though we have the Holy Spirit within us and the grip that our sinful nature had over us has been broken, we were foolish to think we should not be concerned about the times when we are disobedient to God's will. James helps us identify our weaknesses and shortcomings and encourages us to be faithful to our calling in Jesus. That sets the scene for this letter written to those who follow the Lord Jesus Christ and intend to and desire to and want to be faithful. But we have trials and we have times of testing but they lead to maturity and completeness and we should rejoice at the challenge. Sometimes people say I view a problem as merely a challenge. Now we don't go in for slogans so much but we do know that the problems that come our way are trials and testing. Nothing happens to us that it is not by God's will. So we know that he brings these things in order to help us, to bring us to that level of maturity that James is speaking of. The world is constantly uh, pushing us to a particular lifestyle. Through role mo- models, the media, education, and uh, numerous other influences. And these lifestyles appear very attractive and seek to draw us in their direction. Against this, how do we portray our faith in Jesus Christ? I hope we can readily show what he means to us. One of the most important things about the Bible is its honesty. And when we read James's letter, we have many examples of the struggle we have to be faithful followers of Jesus. It might not attract people to Christianity immediately to say that we go through times of testing and trouble. But what we know as followers of Jesus is that there is nothing as important, vital and wonderful as being a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So we take on these trials and these times of testing, knowing that it is all all part of God's purpose for our lives. I don't know whether you, when you were younger, or if people still do today, read The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, a book by Mark Twain, uh, which was written in 1876. Used to be a required reading, I think, when I was at school as a youngster. Um, It's a story about a young boy growing up along the Mississippi River. He was a fun-loving boy, and uh, he skipped school once to go swimming and was made to whitewash his aunt's fence for the entirety of the next day, Saturday, as punishment. But he cleverly persuades the various neighbourhood children to trade him small trinkets and treasures for the privilege of doing his tedious work using reverse psychology to convince them it is actually an enjoyable activity. Tom later trades the trinkets with other students for various denominations of tickets obtained at the local Sunday school for memorising verses of scripture. He cashes these in to the minister to win a much-coveted Bible, offered to studious children as a prize, despite being one of the worst students in the Sunday school and knowing almost nothing of scripture eliciting envy from the students and a mixture of pride and shock from the adults. Well, it's a story about Tom Sawyer, but he tricks people, tricks his friends, tricks the minister at Sunday school. The Bible doesn't trick us into anything. It doesn't try to convince us that something actually is enjoyable when it isn't. It shows us what it is in all its reality and leads us through what we might say is unpleasant and difficult to a time when we can understand and appreciate what it's about. We even read of the Lord Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. He could see the joy in completing the task he was set, even though it was an awful thing that he had to go through. So James says, consider it joy, pure pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials, of many kinds. We've just read that. There's no sugar coating to the Christian faith. Uh, we will and we do face many trials. We are not told to just put a brave face on it, but actually, as in those words, consider it pure joy. We're not just getting through it, we're not just battling away and putting up with something, we count it as joy. 
When the disciples uh, became apostles, when they received the Holy Spirit, Jesus had ascended into heaven and they were left to continue the work. That was their commission. Jesus gave them that work to do. And they were preaching in the temple courtyards and were arrested. Arrested by the Jewish authorities, the priests, the teachers of the law. And they were questioned. And on one of these occasions, when they were arrested, they were eventually released, but not before they were punished. They were flogged. And we read this in Acts chapter 5 and verse 40. They, being the authorities, Jewish authorities, called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. They rejoiced in their suffering because they were counted worthy to suffer for the sake of Christ. They were all quite embarrassed because of how they had failed to understand the death of their Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. He had died, and they had doubted, they had denied him. But now the job was in their hands, having been given the Holy Spirit and the strength that gave them, and the understanding they had of Jesus' death. And now they wanted to do something similar. They couldn't die and suffer like Jesus had for the sin of mankind. But they were called to suffer, And rejoice when they did, because it identified them with the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't enjoy the pain of the flogging they received. But they rejoiced that they received it. The Apostle Paul, he himself suffered in his faith, or for his faith. And he makes it clear that we should expect the same. Philippians chapter 1 verse 29. He says, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Paul suffered and says you should expect the same. You should expect the same. We don't think that things are going wrong when we have troubles, and these can come in in all sorts of ways. Peter says all kinds of trials will come our way. But what they do is to reveal the glory of Reveal the glory of the Lord Jesus as we we joyfully go through these times of testing and these trials and find that our Lord is faithful to help us and guide us. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, If we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Don't think that we can come to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, for an easy option. If we think it's an easy option, we haven't understood it and we haven't put our full faith and trust in God. So Paul says, we are heirs, co-heirs with Christ. What an incredible privilege to be part of God's family, to be a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. What a privilege. But he says it comes with suffering. Now, James, in this passage here, he's talking about the trials and testing we go through. And he also leads us to understand and grasp that it's all about training. God is training us. If he wants us to be mature and complete in our Christian faith, then he'll take us through what is necessary. And we know in life that we do a lot of training. I didn't put much effort into my schoolwork, to my shame. And then I went to work and found that I would have to gained some qualifications to help me in my career. So I did some work, and I got some qualifications in the profession I'm in, in insurance. But there were further qualifications I could have got. But I decided not to go further. I had what I needed, and uh, I'd had enough of studying. (coughs) And in fact, I haven't studied anything since, other than God's word. So that has been my career, but I, I now work with people who, some of them, who are continually studying and gaining more qualifications maybe an MBA or a law degree, because it will further their career and advance them. They continue training. Well, in my education, I decided to stop training many years ago and just get on with the job. We don't do that as Christians. We are continually being trained every day of our lives. 
whether we like it or not. And we can be reluctant learners or we can be joyful learners. And that is what trials and testing is all about. James is keen to show the benefit of the trials in our life. People say no pain, no gain in reference to physical fitness training. Well, the Bible doesn't pretend our life with Christ will be easy. But there is an eternal and spiritual blessing from it. There is a gain, a genuine gain. And if we need a better understanding of our struggles, well, Paul calls it wisdom. We can ask for wisdom. We can rely on God. That's what he said in that passage. We can ask for wisdom, but be be careful that we ask it with a genuine heart. What did we read earlier? Verse 5 in that in that part of James's letter. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. That's wonderful. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. That seems very harsh, doesn't it? But James does not hold back. We need to be dedicated and focused in our Christian life. There's no other way. Sometimes we used to say when we were playing football, if you go into a tackle with someone else, don't hold back. Go into it wholeheartedly, 100%. If you hold back, you're more likely to get injured. But if you go into a tackle fairly, giving it your all, then you'll complete that tackle and probably um, avoid injury. Well, I'm not sure how true that is, whether the statistics actually bear that out. But sometimes we do that in life, don't we? We need to go into something positively, 100%. Otherwise, it just won't work for us. But he does say, be careful that you are positive and certain about it and don't doubt. We will not be complete, James tells us, and fulfilled until we complete the training this training is for life there's no retirement in the christian life paul says to the philippians forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead i press on toward the goal to win the prize for which god has called me heavenward in christ jesus the disciples we could say they lacked many things they were struggling to understand jesus purpose And they were suddenly left with a role, a job to do, in continuing the work of the gospel and in preaching and serving God. But they went through trials and they went through testing times. But God gave them what they needed. He gave them the Holy Spirit. He gave them understanding. He gave them that wisdom that James is speaking of. It's a song that Colin and I used to sing called The Outlaw. It's just a song that describes different ways in which Jesus is thought of and portrayed by people generally. And one of the lines says that, uh, talking of his disciples, he said he was with a band of unschooled ruffians and a few old fishermen. That's just how the song goes. A band of unschooled ruffians and a few old fishermen. That's all Jesus had to help him. They were the disciples. But when we read that in Acts chapter 4, that these disciples were preaching, preaching the gospel of God, We read that the priests and lawyers observed the disciples preaching the gospel and saw the courage of Peter and John and realised that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. They were given what they were needed by God in that moment and they impressed even the priests and the religious lawyers. What we need will be given to us for our training, for the trials, for the testing we go through. We're not just thrown in at the deep end, as it were, and asked to learn to swim without any help and and encouragement. We are given the training that we need. God will do that. This is the manual, the training manual. It's quite extensive. It covers many, many aspects of the Christian life. And we can rely on it to be faithful and to be very helpful. God, through his Holy Spirit that indwells us, also brings us, we speak thinking earlier of comfort that is brought by God in our lives to us. And that comfort, that help, that guidance, in fact the Holy Spirit is called the counsellor in some versions. And he will help us and guide us through life. But we do come up against temptation. And I want us to read now in that passage uh, from verse 12. 
James chapter 1, just for the moment read from verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he has created. So James moves over here to, to just speak about when we are tempted. And we may say, well, this is, this is a testing from God and this is unfair. God here is putting these temptations in my way. And we all know how easy it is to succumb to temptation. But we should learn, and Paul writes this to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. So God brings a trial our way, and it's not for us to say, that's unfair, God, you're tempting me here, and I'm going to succumb to this temptation because you've made it too difficult. He will never do more than we can endure. God will discipline us. He uses different means to do so. God is not trying to catch us out through temptation. They tell us that speed cameras are not there to catch out a driver when he's not aware they're there and going over the speed limit. They're clearly marked in bright yellow with a warning to stop us going fast. Well, sometimes as drivers, we think perhaps they are trying to catch us out as to where they're located. You just come off a very fast road around the corner and suddenly the speed has gone right down there's a camera. But we're told they're not trying to catch us out. God is not trying to catch us out. He wants to train us and develop us and help us to mature. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. The writer to Hebrews tells us in chapter 12 of Hebrews. He's not trying to catch us out. Instead, he offers, as James put it, the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So don't turn around and blame someone else or blame God for why things aren't going right in our lives. Don't fall into that trap of saying it's God's fault I'm being tempted. But when we go in areas and we find we're being tested, look to God for him to give us the wisdom, him to give us the strength, him to give us the guidance to be faithful in our Christian life. And that way we are working towards that crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. I'm going to go back to uh, three verses that I missed out. Because I want to go back to this issue, this issue, the problem of wealth. It runs from verse 9 to verse 11. And uh, this is a problem that goes right throughout the ages. And whether we think we are not rich or whether we are rich, the problem of wealth and the desire for it is there for everybody. Let's just read verses 9 to 11. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way the rich will fade away, even while they go about their business. We don't need to be rich to feel a desire for things that other people have. In fact, one of the commandments deals with this. It's interesting, it's the very last one. And we could go through the Ten Commandments and we could say, well, I'm doing pretty well at all these. We know that we're sinners. We know that absolutely. We could say, well, I'm not murdering people and I'm, and, uh, I'm not stealing things. And the very last one, and it comes in and it says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbour. Our next door neighbour was a woman who owns the house and her partner sometimes stays there. 
He has a lovely Porsche. Oh, it's beautiful. Easily done, isn't it? And we laugh. Well, that's out of my reach. I can, I can easily move away from that and not desire it because there's no way I can possibly have a Porsche. But there might be other things that we want and desire. Maybe we've actually gone out and got those things because we can. Or we're frustrated because we can't and we see other people with them and you think, why? Why do they have that and I don't? You used to say, why are they going on holidays abroad and I can't? And then we realise they can't anyway now. <laughs> or in trouble possibly if they come back. A bit of a leveller, isn't it, this time? But the problem of wealth is there. The desire is there. One of the commandments talks about coveting. Not taking, well, stealing is there, of course, but actually just wanting, desiring. And all of us, all of us fall into that trap so easily. The beauty of being a follower of Jesus, who had no place to lay his head, he had nothing, is that our perspectives of life are completely changed. Wealth and money no longer have a hold on us. The world recognises wealth as an indicator of our worth. But James completely stands out on his head. Those in humble circumstances, he said, are to take pride in their high position. He goes on to say wealth will fade and die. Even unbelievers will say you can't take it with you. Everybody recognises that. And even the richest person will say, well, what point is all these riches if I don't have my health? You see, there is a reality when we think about it that riches aren't everything. But it doesn't stop us wanting and desiring. And time and time again I see adverts on TV for gambling or for the lottery. Over and over again. Why? Feeding our greed. New ways to win money, they say. They don't tell you it's new ways to lose money. And all the time drawing people in. And then they say, oh, you can control this and you can take breaks and you can set this up and you can consult this number if you get into trouble. Why? It's feeding on our greed. But when we're a Christian, and maybe we do feel a bit tempted and we're envious, and then we step back and say, look what I've got. I wrote a song many, many years ago. I wonder if you remember it, Colin. The richest man in the world. You remember it. I'm the richest man in the world in my song I wrote because I know him. I am, I'm the richest man. Heavenly riches, riches beyond telling. It's an incredible thing. There are many warnings right throughout scriptures about wealth. There was a rich man who came to Jesus and he was such an upstanding standing man. He was very devout. He was very generous. He was very popular, it would seem, if you read between the lines of the story. We're given of this rich man. He was a ruler, even though he was young. Everything about him said, what a wonderful man. He had this wealth. And he said, what have I got to do to Jesus? What have I got to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, sell it all. Give it away. Sorry, not sell it. Get, get rid of it all. Give it to the poor. And he couldn't. He went away sad. But one of the gospel writers, I forget which one, said, Jesus looked at him and loved him. I love that expression. It doesn't say that very often. We know that Jesus loves us all, but it actually said of this rich man who turned his back on Jesus because of his wealth, Jesus loved him because there's so much in that man that was lovable except for his riches. And I like to think that that's an indicator in scripture that he did later. Get rid of his riches and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Wealth drags us down. Harder for a rich man, Jesus said, to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Very, very difficult for rich people. We'd like to try see before that temptation obviously we say yes we know that riches can be bad for you it can draw you away I think I can deal with that it won't change me but people say the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil could it be stronger no so the issue of wealth that James deals with here he brings this stark reality and say you're far 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 better off poor better off poor doesn't mean we look to those who are poor in this world and say, you're better off, I'm not going to help you. Of course not. We show the love of Christ towards them. But we should never want wealth for ourselves. And we see others with it. Don't worry. Don't worry. Look what we have. We're the richest people in the world. We have heavenly wealth. Paul wrote to Timothy with instruction on how to teach other Christians. 
His advice was this, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. I love that way he puts it when he writes to Timothy there. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 onwards, that passage. Be rich in good deeds. Be generous and willing to share. That way, we store up treasure for ourselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. <coughs> so that they may take hold, that we may take hold of the life that is truly life. Living the life as a Christian, the life that is truly life. So this sums up this passage, and we've just begun in James' letter here, what the right attitude is all about. Wealth brings arrogance and is unreliable. Alternatively, alternatively, God is trustworthy and generous and willing to, to, uh, bring us, to help us enjoy life that will give us treasure in heaven itself. Rich people are often despised for their wealth. Famous people criticised for their lifestyle. National leaders given no respect. Those in authority blamed for the ills of the world. But the believer in Jesus knows a life that is truly life, or as Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. We know that that is the life that we want, not the life of the rich, the so-called successful and the famous a life in service to God and the, and the Lord Jesus Christ is life to the full. Life to the full. And if someone was to walk in here with all the wealth in the world, all the influence, all the power, all the recognition, the fame, the adulation, the respect of people, if they were to come in here and I say, but you don't have what I have. You don't have what I have. Because I have the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have an eternity secure in heaven with heavenly riches beyond anything this world can offer. And that's forever and ever. Wealth, trials, testing, temptation. We may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, Peter says, 1 Peter chapter 1. But we have the perfect promise that is part of our maturing as a Christian. We don't despair or run. We rejoice that we are worthy of suffering as our Saviour did. Let's finish now with our final hymn.
Let's just pray now as we close. Let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the lesson that we have learned and continue to learn from your word, especially James, who brings it so clearly to us. We recognize our own failings, but we know what we desire most of all, and we desire to be faithful servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, we pray you'll give us that wisdom to help us to deal with those times of testing, those times of temptation. Help us not to blame you. Help us to look to you to guide us and help us in those times of trouble and difficulty. Our Father, we pray you'll keep us away from the desire of wealth that other people have and the possessions that they have. We know how attractive they can be. But Father, we want to be faithful to you and the calling we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. We recognise that as Christians we have trusted in our Saviour for our salvation, knowing that his death on the cross has won us the great victory over sin and death, that he paid the price that we might escape the penalty so that we can be included in your family, become joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ and receive an inheritance in heaven for all eternity. So, Father, we thank you for these wonderful things that we have in Christ. Help us, we pray, to deal with the things that come our way, that we might be faithful to what we have believed in and faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Be with us now as we go our separate ways and bless us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen.